see him later. <laughs> Morning, church. Happy Easter or happy Resurrection Day, whichever you prefer. Hi, Betty. She's, she, she's playing the organ, so we put her all the way on the end on this side. That's how we do it. Hey, church, we are going to start off with a traditional hymn this morning. Christ the Lord is risen today, and the next word is Alleluia. And what does that mean? It means God be praised. Alleluia is an exclamation of praise. 
So uh, let me just start with this. He is risen? risen. Yes. I need you to risen because we're going to sing first one, two, three. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah, indeed. Friends, it is so, it's such a joy and honor to see you this morning because Christ is risen. On behalf of the Calvert Grace Community Church family, I want to welcome you. Whether you've called this place home for a really long time or whether you are just stopping by, I hope that you feel welcome and you feel the joy that we are all experiencing this morning, remembering that Jesus is risen. My name is Trevin. I'm one of the pastors here. I help oversee the outreach ministry. And Right now, I'd like to invite our kids, for grades one through five, they can go to your children's church now. Um, there might not be too many of them this service, but that's all right. Um, we, out the doors to my right. If you're visiting with us, um, I would like you to get to know somebody. There's some smiling faces out there, the Lores, the Lore family, and they would love to get you connected. They can answer some of your questions. There's also some little cards on the seat backs in front of you where you can fill out info and drop it in. Um, the, the offering plates on your way out. Um, lastly, I'd like to invite you, there's these little um, welcome books on the end of each row, so it's your left. If you could just grab that and drop your name in there. Um, this is our way of just making sure that our church family is here, and it's a way for us to follow up if you would like us to. We're blessed to have each of you here to praise God this morning for what he has done for us through Jesus. We're also blessed to have the opportunity to proclaim the good news of Jesus this morning through God's gift of music. So we invite you now to join us as our praise team, choir, and orchestra lead us in worship through song. We invite you to worship with us as we celebrate the risen Lord, Jesus Christ. We join in the worship that is eternally taking place right now in heaven. Those around the throne of God fall down in worship before him constantly as they lay crowns before him and say, You are worthy, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they have their being. 
The Apostle John gives us this beautiful picture of God the Father and the resurrected Christ. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and to open the scroll? Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by four living creatures and the elders, and they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. And I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and in a loud voice they say, Worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. We crown you, Lord Jesus, Lamb of God. We celebrate your resurrection from the dead and our purchase with your blood. Please stand as we sing together, crown him with many crowns.
Jesus, the worthy king, conquered the grave. The Apostle Paul tells us that it was God who raised Christ from the dead and God who gave him the seat of honor at his right hand in the heavenly places. Christ has been given this place of honor because of his obedience to carry out the plans of God the Father from the creation of time. For this reason, he is rightfully far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. Who is this King Jesus? He is the firstborn of the resurrection, the head of the church, the Alpha and Omega, the one who was, the one who is, and is to come. This King Jesus is the bread of life, the good shepherd, and the door to God. He is the light of the world and the son of God. He is the lion of Judah, the prince of peace, the promised Messiah. Who is this king? He is the savior of the world.
Jesus reigns today in heaven and in the hearts of those who love him. The Bible promises that he will come again to establish his permanent reign in his forever kingdom. Jesus isn't king because of political power, military might, accumulated wealth or riches, or even because of an impressive Jewish lineage. Jesus is king because of the cross. Here, the will of God was carried out in sacred surrender as he destroyed the powers of sin and death. Jesus was betrayed and abandoned by his closest friends. He was publicly humiliated, assaulted, mocked, flogged, and executed in the most torturous method of the day. And for the first time ever, God the Father turned away from him. The reason? This was God's plan. The prophet Isaiah said, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord, God himself, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. On the cross, Jesus was not suffering for his own sins. He was suffering for ours. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, suspended between life and death, the scribes, chief priests, and those who passed by mocked him and said, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. If you are the son of God, come down, save yourself. But he didn't. He saved you and me instead. So abuse and scorn. 
on the cross, Jesus takes the punishment for the sins of mankind. In his suffering and death, he substitutes his life for ours. When we put our trust in Christ, his death is applied to our life. By his grace and mercy, we receive his righteous standing before God. We are brought back from spiritual death and his new resurrection power makes us spiritually alive. On the cross, the curse of sin and the law is lifted and we are now blessed, redeemed, and rich beyond measure in our relationship with Christ. Because of the cross, you are not a stranger to God any longer. You have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. This is all God's grace and mercy. This is how God so loved the world. Brothers and sisters, what is our part then? What is the will of God for us? It is to believe in the one that he sent. The work of salvation is believing, putting your faith and life's trust in the work of Christ on the cross. The challenge Jesus gave to the disciple Thomas was, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. This call to faith is for us today. Join your hands with the nail-scarred hands of Jesus and find real life in him. This is where I will put my trust in Jesus lifted up and the forgiveness flowing from his nail-scarred hands. This is where I lay down my pride, my shame is crucified because of the mercy found inside his nail-scarred hands.
Happy Easter, church. Were you listening closely to the words of that song? Oh, what love. See what his grace has done. In that crimson flood, my hope began. My forever changed. All of my debts been paid. Out of the grave, I have been raised to life again. You know, we come together every Easter to celebrate the greatest act of love that will ever be known to man. We're here to praise God for sending His Son, Jesus, to pay the penalty for our sins through His death on the cross and to thank God for the fact that we can confidently declare that Jesus is risen. But, you know, in the midst of remembering the amazing miracle of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we can too easily overlook the fact that it is not just the resurrection of Jesus that we come to celebrate this morning. Because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, by our faith in Him as our Lord and Savior this morning, we are also celebrating the fact, as the choir just sang, that His resurrection is is my resurrection. It's your resurrection. It's our resurrection that we're here celebrating this morning. It can be easy for us to become so focused on the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus as interesting, compelling, amazing history that we completely miss what today's celebration of Jesus being risen from the grave means for us in the here and now, this very morning. This morning, our passage from God's Word reminds us that all that Jesus is and all that Jesus did defines all that we are in Jesus. In Romans chapter 6, Paul explains to his readers what the practical reality is of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus for believers. Follow along with me as we see what he writes in Romans 6, verses 3 through 5. He says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. By our faith in Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus becomes the death and burial of our old life and resurrection with him to newness of life. What we celebrate in the resurrection of Jesus And the salvation he brings is more than a promise for our eternity to come. It is a promise of our what is today through the power of his resurrection in us. Paul is impressing on us we are not the same person after we place our faith in Jesus that we were before we placed our faith in Jesus. He explains it this way as he goes on in verses 6 and 7. He writes, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Our old self that he's talking about was the person we were before coming to faith in Jesus. The person who could not resist sin. The person who God's word says could not comprehend the spiritual truths of God. The person who Paul describes as being a weak, ungodly sinner who was an enemy of God. Just as certain as Jesus was crucified, Paul declares our old self was crucified on that cross with Jesus Our old self no longer exists when we come to faith in Jesus. We are no longer slaves to the sin that held our old self captive. The death of Jesus did more than just set us free from the penalty of our sins. 
It sets us free from the power of sin over us. We are not the person we were before coming to faith in Jesus. That person is gone. It is a reality. Now, Paul is not saying sin was crucified. It doesn't say that. Sin remains in the world, but we're no longer slaves to a church. It no longer has authority over us. It no longer has mastery over us. Because of what Jesus has done, we're free to say no to sin, no to temptation, no to those things that the world brings to our feet to lead us away from our God. That power, that resurrection power, is within us this very morning. But our death to our old self and freedom from sin is not the end of what Jesus has done for us. The death and burial of our old self had as its end purpose our newness of life. It's an eternal life, and it's a life that begins to be lived in the moment we place our faith. We step into God's eternal kingdom. Paul continues in Romans 6, 8 through 10. He says, now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. The union we have with Jesus through our faith in him is not just in his death and burial, but it continues into his resurrection to eternal life. The resurrection of Jesus we celebrate this morning is an assurance of our resurrection to eternal life, to be lived out with him. But we can't overlook what Paul emphasizes at the end of verse 10. The life Jesus was raised to live, the newness of life that we are raised to live is a life to be lived for God and for His glory. And it's not just a life to be lived for God in the eternity to come when we pass out of this world and into God's eternal kingdom. It's a life to be lived for God every day, every morning that we awake and we step out into the world. Our calling in our new life in Jesus, our resurrection life, is the same calling that Jesus had to put God before all else in life. To see God as God sees life. To trust God's call on our life. The resurrection power within us is to be used for God's glory. We are to give God our life just as Jesus gave us his life. Because our old self was crucified with Jesus and we've been raised to newness of life with Jesus, Paul commands us, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Paul knows that while we're this new creation, that those old habits linger. And while we're not any longer controlled or mastered by sin, it's always knocking at the door. And we need to live with an intentionality of living in the truth that is. Paul's call is to put our feet to our faith, to step out into the faith that we declare when we claim Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And celebrating what Jesus has done, as joyful as this is this morning, is not the same as living in the truth of who we are in Jesus. And that's what Paul is calling us to, to act on the truth of our old self having been crucified as we celebrate our resurrection to newness of life with Christ this morning. Paul's instructing us to live in the reality that exists, to stop acting like we're waiting to become more than we already are in Jesus. Susie and I were overseas, you guys know, seeing our uh, son and daughter-in-law and grand new granddaughter. And a couple days, uh, day before the 
trip, we were able to get our boarding pass for the, for the flight, save us time at the airport. Now, if I had taken that boarding pass, I had the right to get on the plane. But if I hadn't stepped on the plane, that boarding pass was meaningless to me. And what Paul is telling us here this morning is, look, you've got the boarding pass. You're on board. You're in God's kingdom. Now do something with what you've been given. Act on the truth of who you are in Christ this morning. Acknowledge the fact that you're not the old self that you were before Jesus. Too many of us say, well, you know, it's, it's just who I am. No, it's who you were in those struggles that we have in life, but it's not who you are in Christ. You have a power to overcome the things that the world brings us that you didn't have before. He's calling us to acknowledge that when we began a new life, when we came to faith in Jesus, that we had the ability to do life differently. He wants us to acknowledge the fact that we have the power of Jesus' resurrection to navigate life, to acknowledge that we have a calling along with that power to live for God in this life and not for the world. Paul is calling us to look at all Jesus has done and live in the truth of who we are in Jesus. You know, God's Word tells us the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus has transformed us. It has moved us from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of light. From being a weak, godless sinner who was an enemy of God to a friend of God. From being at war with God to being at peace with God. From being far off from God to being near to God. Jesus has moved us from being strangers and aliens to being fellow citizens of heaven with the saints. He has moved us from condemnation before God to being declared righteous before God from eternal death to eternal life. Because of what Jesus has done, God's word says that we're a new creation, forgiven our sins, free from our sins, sons and daughters of God, co-heirs with Christ, ambassadors of God, God's chosen people, holy, set apart for God, participants in Jesus' glory, seated with Jesus in the heavenly realms, and it goes on and on and on and on, and it's who you are, it's who I am, it's who we are in Jesus this morning. We're not the old person that we were, We've been resurrected to newness of life in him. Amen? Amen. And this is the good news that comes with that message. And it's part of what we celebrate this morning. Because you see, the celebration we're having for Jesus is not for just for those of us who are followers of Jesus. Because God's desire is for all who will believe in Jesus to come into his family. And God invites you this morning to join our celebration of what Jesus has done. He invites you to place your faith in Jesus as your Savior if you haven't, to confess your need for his forgiveness of your sins and to trust him as your Lord. What is God saying to you this morning? What is your response to his invitation? The resurrection of Jesus that we celebrate is a fact the resurrection to newness of life is also a fact for all who have believed in him. Church, for all of us that know Jesus as our Savior, God is calling us to recognize that old self is gone. We're free from both the penalty and power of sin because of what Jesus has done. And to recognize the resurrection of Jesus to newness of life is our resurrection to newness of life through him. We need to be reminding ourselves of that every morning when we wake up and every evening when we go to bed because God is calling us to live for him and for his glory. How are we, how are you going to respond to that call as we step out into God's world this morning? We celebrate Jesus has risen this morning and because of what Jesus has done, we celebrate that we too have been raised up with him, redeemed and restored, reconciled and renewed, released from our bondage to sin to serve our God today and forevermore. So as we continue our service, I want to invite you to stand and join with the praise team, choir, and musicians as we rejoice and praise God in song for all Jesus has done that makes us all that we are in Jesus.
you, church. story is just a story unless it's just a story unless Christ is yours to the world it is foolishness but to believers in Christ it is life Jesus our risen Savior is alive and reigning in heaven as his followers the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come we are alive in the spirit 
and full of God's life and light. We will share in the resurrection from the dead and proclaim this truth as our own, that as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Alive forever. Amen. Amen. service this morning with uh, King of Kings. And uh, as we sing, I want you to pay real careful attention to the text because it's a recap of what we've been singing, what we've been talking about for the last hour about the risen Savior, our hope, our life, and our love. Please stand. Let's do it. King of Kings.
Sing it together. we praise you for the resurrection of your son. We praise you for the resurrection of us, God. May all the glory and honor be yours as we leave to declare your good news this and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a blessed Easter, church. Greet one another as you go.